thank you all the people I can't see or currently can't hear um, for coming to log on and listen to me, hear me virtually. Um, you can see me for the minute. Um, I'm going to turn myself off in a second um, so that you're not distracted by my visage. Um, so in fact, let's get that bit done so I don't distract you. Hopefully you can still see and hear me. Um, so um, I was asked by Sir Keith to talk about trauma imaging. Um, and so I thought long and hard about how I would address this. I've, I've done quite a few talks on trauma imaging, but they're normally to imaging professionals. And I rather felt that the audience tonight would be different. So I've tried to address it on a whole scope. Um, for those of you that are interested, that is radiology back in the day, military radiology with a radiology set up in the top corner and uh, the lead shielding in the bottom corner, which uh, hopefully we will talk about later on. Why me? So I'm a consultant radiologist. I specialize in uh, head and neck radio radiology and trauma radiology. I've been a consultant for eight years up at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, which is that building in the top right corner that looks like three toilets side by side by side. And um, hopefully the chief exec isn't listening uh, to hear me criticizing our architecture. Um, I've been in the military for 22 years, um, which has included two, two tours of Afghanistan, one for six months as a general duties medical officer. And in fact, in that middle picture, the person in the front of that in the blue lead uh, gown, I don't know if you can see my pointer, here is me. Um, and then this is uh, my office as a consultant radiologist when I was out there for three months. Um, so that's deployed medicine. And in the bottom right corner, very sadly, are the victims of the Manchester bombing. Um, and I was involved in the imaging for the dead uh, for the Manchester bombing and the CT postmortems and the forensic work that was and is ongoing with that event. I have also developed image guidelines for multi-trauma imaging nationally, mass casualty event imaging. Um, and I guess the thing I ought to tell you very clearly is uh, I have no external funding. I have no industry inducements to talk. Uh, these are my thoughts based on my experiences and my beliefs. They're not dogma, they're not doctrine, certainly not military doctrine. Um, and this is not the Q Queen Elizabeth way necessarily. Uh, we do practice the way that I uh, uh, I'm going to sort of talk about this evening, but I suppose that's possibly a reflection of me working there and within the military and those two institutions interacting with me. Um, I probably ought to mention that I'm also the lead radiologist for the MOD at the moment as well, just to add to my stresses. Um, something that I'm very aware of um, is this Dunning-Kruger effect, and Dunning-Kruger would suggest that people who are willing to expound on a topic and have that confidence are usually idiots without insight. Um, I don't want to be that. Um, I'm very acutely aware of what happens when people who claim to be experts, usually men as evidenced in the top right corner, get together and decide that they're gonna be clever together. Um, and fundamentally, I'm really more like that duck in the bottom right corner, trying to look cool and uh, freaking out uh, under the water. The truth is, uh, the truth is this evening, you've got me sort of slightly on my home ground because as a radiologist, I don't really like light rooms and I don't really like um, you know, uh, uh, other people, are, it sort of hones my nice personality disorder nicely to be able to sit in a dark room and shout at a screen. So I, perhaps I'm on better form than otherwise I would be. Um, I hope uh, that unlike me, you all have some form of drink or refreshment to uh, sit and enjoy this with. And um, hopefully we're just gonna have a bit of a chat rather than me sort of lobbing uh, a doctrine or dogma at everyone. So um, topics that I wanted to cover, I wanted to cover how we image and where imaging fits in. And I really wanted it to be in the whole patient pathway. I was very cognizant when starting to write this talk that you know I'm very firmly a secondary healthcare clinician and therefore view the world through the spectrum of <clears throat> the hospital. And I, and I very much wanted to include you know, the pre-hospital and the very forward imaging that occurs um, and all the way through the process. I've not really touched all that much on, on primary uh, healthcare because I, I couldn't quite work out outside of the sort of forward paramedic space necessarily where trauma imaging fitted in. Um, so please forgive me if um, I, I miss those elements out. I'm gonna talk about what we do now, things that I think we could do, things that are coming on the horizon, things that are very far off, but should be quite cool when they happen. I'm gonna try and give you lots of pictures because that is basically what I do as a radiologist. I'm effectively an interior designer for people. Um, and um, as I say, this isn't dogma, this isn't didactic instruction. This is the world according to Mark. So um, here we go. So I'm gonna start with small scale um, and please forgive me when I say small scale. What I mean is the one, two, three, four person casualty event, the not mass casualty type situation. And I'm gonna try and step through um, um, uh, the, pr the, the varying levels of care and therefore where imaging fits in. I'm gonna try and explain a little bit about how images are formed because 
you know, I think that's probably key to helping interpret the images. Um, and I'm going to just show some little lessons I've learned and um, hopefully show you some interesting cases. Um, so forward imaging, here we go. Um, so the two main bits um, in forward imaging that really I've come across um, are point of care ultrasound or forward ultrasound and Reboa. So forward ultrasound, <clears throat> funnily enough, um, th this is something that I only decided to include in the talk very recently and largely based on uh, an experience I had about three, four weeks ago. I am in typical um, sad middle-aged middle-class fashion, uh, a highly addicted road cyclist. And I was out having a bike ride and came across um, a person collapsed in the community out in the middle of nowhere collapsed on his bike and um, effectively um, in cardiac arrest, no measurable cardiac output, no breathing. Um, and I started CPR called uh, 999 and within 15 minutes had a helicopter and two ambulances arrive. Um, and when the very excellent <laughs> paramedics took over from a completely panicked radiologist, um, they uh, put uh, pads on him, they uh, found him to be in VF, shocked him and worked on him for a while. And then they got out a GEV scan, which is the top right of the ultrasound pointer care machines um, and started um, looking for cardiac movement and doing what I hadn't really realized was being done that frequently, forward point of care ultrasound. Now, as I guess I ought to say, I'm not industry sponsored. Um, so I've tried to put a range of manufacturers out here. So you've got a Philips machine, a GE machine, Clarius in the bottom left, which also has the, the sweet trick of being wireless. And in the bottom right, this is Konica Minolta, who are also wireless. Um, so I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk more about ultrasound in the bit further on about ultrasound. But fundamentally, you know, point of care ultrasound has a very good utility um, in terms of assessing for fluid in the tummy, which we'll come on to later on in the fast scans, but also in assessing cardiac motility out in the forward space. And there are further applications for it, which we're exploring in the military, and I'll talk about those in terms of stuff on the horizon. So that takes me to Reboa. And um, now look, I'm a diagnostic radiologist. So this is very firmly outside of my comfort zone. Um, I went and sought some advice from uh, an ex-colleague of mine, Tim Fotheringham down at the Royal London, who's been involved in Reboa for a long time. So much of what I'm about to mention is learnings from Tim um, and sort of stuff that I know about as a radiologist sort of immersed in the dark world of radiology. So first described in the 1950s, uh, first actually started to be used in the 2000s for abdominal aortic aneurysms. Um, but to my knowledge, there are no longitudinal uh, large observational studies, no large randomized clinical trials. There is, as I've just shown in the link in the top, or the picture in the top right, the UK Reboa trial, which has been running since November 17. In fact, uh, uh, the Royal London was the first site to go live with the trial in November 17. And they're aiming to involve 120 patients within that study collection. Um, and they are currently at 78 out of 120 patients. So Fundamentally, this is about stopping hemorrhage um, and access via a femoral artery, a balloon being inserted into the aorta using anatomical landmarks to inflate the balloon in what I can show you as on the picture as being zone one or zone three, um, zone one fundamentally above the diaphragm and the balloon being inflated to stop bleeding within the abdominal uh, cavity and below. Um, and zone three uh, around the level of the bifurcation of the aorta um, and, uh, and you would inflate the balloon above that bifurcation and the idea is to stop pelvic bleeding and bleed, bleeding distal further down to the pelvis. What are the risks of, of putting of doing this out in the field? Well look, dissection when you get into the into the vessel causing a dissection flap, causing a pseudoaneurysm, rupturing the aorta, ischemia to end organs, these are all easy to label risks. Um, the, 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 the learning points uh, that Tim wanted me particularly to share were that there are a limited number of cases overall that have been done, particularly in the UK. So it's hard to get experience and therefore also hard to get meaningful data. And indeed, I don't think it would be entirely unfair to, to say slightly, slightly snarkily, perhaps, that there are probably as many papers and written and published on Reboa uh, than there are actually cases done um, globally. Um, there's a significant learning curve with the process, placing that balloon, what size of balloon you inflate, how long you leave the balloon up and, 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 and when you deflate it. Um, reliable access is very much an issue and Tim tells me that about 30% of patients or cases uh, get failed access uh, to get that balloon in. Um, but he does tell me that smaller devices have helped with the issues of distal ischemia and limb loss secondary to life-saving and clearly he pointed out that the time to balloon deflation is very critical. 
So that's Reboa. I've talked probably far more than really I ought to about it. Um, the other thing I'd probably point out is that the patient that they're drawing that picture on looks very comfortable lying on a pillow and whatnot. It's never like that, of course, as you all know. Um, so the next step in the pathway of imaging is very much that, that emergency department. Um, and that's, that's what I consider very much to be that first point of entry into the hospital. Um, and in trauma, we, we, we sort of interface our imaging with the resuscitation and use x-rays as part of that primary survey for the patient. And that's something that I'd very firmly encourage people to do, even as we move to more and more liberal use of trauma CT scanning. Um, I think, you know, x-rays definitely have a place as part of that primary survey and definitely have utility in diagnosis of early issues, such as, for example, a pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax, which I firmly believe we should never, ever see on a CT scan. Um, Fast scanning and ultrasounds, so that's focused abdominal sonography and trauma. That, that's not as commonly used as you might think, but it is being used in subcenters. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the CT uh, and the, the CT traumagram and, and how we obtain it, CT imaging, um, I thought I'd address. And that's, you know, all of this is basically helping to stratify trauma patients for care and um, for the direction of their treatment and their management. And again, something that I will come back to at the end, you know, images are just images. They're not you know, the patient is far more than just the images that, that we crazy people in the dark rooms obtain for you. So um, um, let's move on to x-rays. So um, I thought I'd just gently touch on how x-rays are made. So fundamentally, this, 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 nope, we've gone the wrong way. Here we go. This, this item here, this is an x-ray tube. I've just cut it down from a textbook. Um, and what we're doing is we're firing electrons um, from a cathode across to an anode. Um, and um, those electrons, rapidly move across the very small space between the two uh, at the anode and the cathode and they smash into that anode um, and they abruptly stop. Um, and um, given that um, there's an awful lot of kinetic energy that suddenly it becomes non-kinetic and given the law of the conservation of energy, that basically says, you, you know, you can't lose energy. Something has to happen to the energy and two things happen. One, uh, there's heat uh, and two, photons are created uh, and the photon um, is, is what our X-ray beam is made of. And there's a very exciting word for that. It's called Bremsstrahlung. And that's, that's the breaking energy that forms an X-ray image. And then those X-rays get blatted out um, and uh, they then get, get pushed through an object, which in medical imaging is on the whole, a patient or part of a patient. And some are absorbed and some are not absorbed. And the degree of absorption fundamentally develops the picture, which is essentially a density map. Um, and uh, that's sort of analogous to the hand throwing the shadow. And below that is an x-ray of um, the wife um, of the person who discovered x-rays. That was William uh, Rontgen in 18, well, he was born in 1845, died in 1923, discovered x-rays in 1895, for which he was awarded the inaugural Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. And as part of his experimentation into x-rays, he x-rayed his wife's hand um, rather than risking his own, which is reasonably cruel, you might suggest. Um, so next to him is the first person to clinically use x-rays, who I'm delighted to say uh, is, uh, uh, was a major um, in, 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 in the army. This is John Hall Edwards. He was also a radiologist. Well, they didn't really have the word radiologist back then. He was a surgeon radiographer in Birmingham, um, and he took the first clinical x-ray in 1896. Uh, developed an x-ray field unit uh, incorporated into the Warwickshire Regiment um, where he was appointed a major. He was surgeon radiographer in the Imperial Yeomanry and I'm delighted to say that that portrait you can see was just recently purchased by the Museum of Military Medicine to sort of recognise him as an incredibly important person in terms of imaging in the UK. Um, what I would hope you might notice in that um, portrait is his position. You can't see his left arm. And if you look at his right arm, he's missing a lot of his fingers and has a sort of a sort of a leathery type prosthesis covering the remainder of his hand. And fun actually, the truth is he um, he was missing his left forearm and his left hand, which had been amputated. And he was missing fingers on his right hand amputated uh, because they had developed radiation induced cancer as part of his early work with radiation because we didn't really know at that point about the risks of radiation and cancer formation and skin damage and all the other things that we do now know, which is why we try to uh, reduce our use of, um, of, of, uh, uh, of radiation as much as possible. The last picture I put up there really as a, as a throwback to my initial comment to you all uh, about radiologists feeling comfortable in dark rooms. We often have these sort of slightly sad phone discussions with people where the radiologist is shouting and the person wanting on the phone is shouting and we have these 
awkward discussions where we're trying to minimise um, use of radiation. And, and I would like to hope that really that sort of that sort of situation of, of sort of poor intercollegiate uh, 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 communication is going away as we all become far more integrated into teams that work together. And I, and I put up a really interesting paper, a paper that I found very interesting um, from 2015, talking about how those those sort of intercollegiate professional in communication conversations we have actually often don't go as well as we'd want to and how that's bad for patients and bad for us. Uh, I digress slightly. So what can we get on a chest X-ray? So this is a great uh, chest X-ray of a patient who's been shot. You can see the bullet projected over the midline of the neck with um, an ET tube in situ. There's a right-sided trauma line. Uh, there's a finger overlying the clavicle, which is helping hold the patient down because they're relatively young and they're in pain and they're confused. Um, ideally, you wouldn't see that, but in some cases, you you know, you just can't avoid it. There's a large bore right-sided chest drain, and there's volume loss in the right hemithorax with some some air seen within the subcutaneous tissues of the right lateral chest wall. That's subcutaneous emphysema, possibly related to the line coming in, or to that chest drain coming in, possibly related to the line or the bullet. Um, and you can see this grayed out appearance to the right lung. You can see some volume loss, and you can see, I hope, some areas of increased density. Um, and what we're seeing there is, is a hemoneumothorax in a patient who's been shot. So um, two of the things that you can see on a chest X-ray. Fractures and a flail, I've done my best to put both into the same image. So this is a patient who came off a motorbike. Um, and again, I hope I can uh, convince you that there are rib, rib fractures, quite a lot of rib fractures on the right hand side. Please note that when you're looking at an X-ray, the picture is inverted, i.e. it's almost, it's as if the patient is facing you. So what um, um, everyone else would see as being on the right is actually on the left as, 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 as related to the patient. And, and, and so therefore these fractures are on the right hand side and there are fractures here and there are fractures laterally as well. And this is, this is a flail chest. Now, technically a flail chest should have three or more contiguous ribs fractured in two or more places. But the truth is, if we're talking about the mechanics of respiration, a segment of only one or two ribs can act as a flail. So there is a valid argument in the difference between a radiological definition of a flail and a clinical definition of a flail. But what matters is the ability or the inability to aerate the lung because you've lost that support to the cage opening and closing and therefore that bellows mechanism. The other thing that I would also like to point out, and which is why I put the CT up, is that um, the existence of a flail um, should make you very wary about underlying pulmonary contusions, pneumothorax or hemothorax and indeed in this patient there's the associated pneumothorax and there's some pulmonary contusions with some um, consolidation and lung that's basically completely failing to uh, aerate. I'm now not going to show you penetration because we saw that earlier on but I'll show you air under the diaphragm and this is bilateral free air under the hemidiaphragms um, um, and um, um, uh, the key here really to note is that um, you you can't see bowel markings under the hemidiaphragms. So um, th that's what really gives what in this case is a very large um, um, uh, free gas in the abdomen um, versus small in a small case, you possibly would just see a line under one hemidiaphragm. You'd see both sides of the hemidiaphragm as you can here. In this case, you can see both so massively. You might be forgiven for thinking that this is grossly dilated bowel, but you would expect to see markings of the bowel, remembering, of course, that um, the small bowel has these valvuli conaventis, also known as plie circulares, which are complete bands traversing the bowel, um, and bearing also in mind that small bowel maximum diameter or, uh, on, a, on an abdominal x-ray is three centimeters or less. Large bowel has hystri, which are incomplete bands, and the maximum diameter is six centimeters or less, and that the cecum or the sigmoid, which have their large bowel markings, they are special areas of large bowel, and they can be up to nine centimeters in diameter. Um, but this is uh, free air under the uh, hemidiaphragms. The other thing that I would also like to say is take care and take time to look at the whole film. It's easy to be distracted, and particularly in trauma, but and, and, and in fact, I am guilty, I missed this. This is a bullet just peeking in under the bottom right corner of the film here, slightly hard to see on here, um, but and it's easy to be distracted because of course, there's a trauma line that's in, there's stuff going on in the lung with, with some consolidation and with some volume loss compared to the contralateral side. Um, and 
But on the CT scan, you can clearly see here's the bullet and here's the liver injury, this triangle of low density with some very dark areas. This is gas within it. Um, ignore this. This is an uh, artifact from, from, from the patient's arms. Um, but this bit of a liver injury, and, and that would be exceptionally easy to miss that on the chest x-ray. So always check the edges of the film. And if there are any radiology registrars watching, please, that is an absolute um, you know, uh, uh, gimme in the, in, the, in the exam. They do love to put things where there's something of note on the edge of the film. Um, and of course, for those of you who aren't radiologists, you're gonna look super cool if you find it. Um, so um, long bones, pelvis. Um, so I didn't really wanna show a fracture because hopefully you've all seen what fractures look like. I do want to comment, however, that it is really important in the long bones to look for those fractures because you know there's that classic comment about blood on the floor and four more with that shocked hypotensive trauma patient. And those four more, chest, abdo, pelvis, and femur, you can lose up to one and a half liters of blood in a closed femoral fracture. You can lose up to a liter of blood in a closed tibial fracture. So fractures are really important to find. What I wanted to do here was just show some foreign bodies. Um, and what I also really wanted to talk about was 2D versus 3D. So remember that an X-ray is a 2D representation of a 3D thing, um, i.e. the we're taking that 3D person and flattening them out for the purposes of an X-ray. So it's, it can be very easy to be confused about where something is. And indeed, this patient, the bullet, which is projected over the pelvic inlet, is truly within the patient. You can see this is the bladder, this is the rectum, and here's the metal with its shininess. Metal is very, very dense and therefore causes this appearance on CT with artifacts streaming off it. And on this patient, there's a ball bearing projected over the inferior aspect of the pubic symphysis on the right, just coming onto that inferior pubic ramus. Um, and again, on the CT scan, you can actually see that they're lying on it. It's sort of embedded within the tissues of the buttock, and that's, that's somebody with a ball bearing stuck in them um, from an explosion. So foreign bodies are very useful, um, or uh, x-ray is very useful to find a foreign body. So let's move on to ultrasound. Um, so ultrasound is analogous to uh, uh, the sonar that dolphins use. You, you lob out a sound wave fundamentally, you wait for it to bounce off something and come back to you and you measure that time and the distance and you can assess, assess the change in the nature of the sound wave and that can tell you information about what is out there um, and I thought it would be quite fun in a sad radiological way to show an ultrasound being performed on a dolphin ultrasound on on sonar that sort of amuses me pathetically perhaps um, what I did want to point out though is that ultrasound generation is in almost every single case generated through the application of an electrical uh, a bit of electricity to a to a crystal to 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 a piece of crystal which then causes and that electricity causes something called the reverse piezoelectric effect it causes that crystal to to lengthen and contract and that lengthening and contraction causes a sound frequency to be to be emanated um, and the reason i put that wavelength and frequencies in there is to say that a particular crystal formation and a particular crystal type will produce a set frequency and what that frequency does or is really does matter higher frequencies uh, uh um uh, have shorter wavelengths. That shorter wavelength as seen in the top right corner. If you imagine between the peaks of the wavelength, imagine that as a set distance, the object that you might wish to visualize cannot easily be lost in between those frequency peaks versus a small object between the, the frequency peaks of a broader, a low frequency wavelength. So therefore, I hope I can convince you that high frequency ultrasound is far better for picking up fine detail. But the cost of that is that those high frequency wavelengths are absorbed or attenuated more easily in tissue. So a high frequency ultrasound probe is great for fine detail, but it is rubbish for going deep into a patient. So anybody who tries to sell you or give you an ultrasound machine and says, this machine can do it all, if, with the one caveat, if it is a traditional piezoelectric generating ultrasound piece of equipment or the pro, it cannot do everything all at once. There is always a trade-off to be had. There is one company, and I'll come on to them later on, who are creating ultrasound with a, a, a computer chip, um, and therefore they can make any sort of frequency that they like. So that ultrasound machine can produce all sorts of things and therefore can truly do an awful lot more. But there are there is a cost to that as long as there is in life with everything. So please remember, that if somebody tells you or gives you a probe and says this probe can do it all, it can't. Um, and that's simply because of physics. So um, what, what, can, um, what can we do with ultrasound? Well, fundamentally in trauma, we can do fast. Focused abdominal sonography and trauma. Um, that's what it used to be called. Um, I think now um, it's been renamed focused assessment with sonography for trauma. A fine detail, but I think it's sort of to basically address the issues of E faster, of extended uh, fast scanning where you take the original four areas that were described the a b c d on that man picture there or the, 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 the 
personal picture, um, where you scan the right upper quadrant looking at the perihepatic and hepatorenal uh, region, the left upper quadrant around the spleen, the suprapubic view looking down and uh, low in the pelvis um, for fluid and, and looking with up at the heart with a subzipoid uh, view. And that E bit is this extended look for a pneumothorax. Um, so how good is FAST? Well, not great is the honest answer. So this is a study, in fact, that I was part of um, and we used um, military patients who had all had CT and who had all had um, FAST who had all gone to have a laparotomy. So we had a great set of control answers. You know, these patients went on to laparotomy and we had therefore a good comparator to find out how good we, we, we really were, were. The truth is CT is brilliant. There was almost, there was almost, it was 99.9% .9 sensitivity and specificity. Now, listen, I am not a medical statistician and fundamentally I struggle with this, but sensitivity, how many injuries are seen? Specificity, how many true negative patients are called as such? What do I mean by that? A sensitive test, helps rule out a disease when the test is negative, and a specific test helps rule a disease in when positive. Well, if CT is 99.9% .9 on both, it's good. Now, if you look at FAST, we've only got a specificity of 0.98. Everything else fails. So the sensitivity at 0.56 ain't great. So what, what does that really mean? Well, what that really means is that at a 95% confidence interval, I can tell you that if we see an injury on scanning, it is gonna be probably an injury, i.e. if we see fluid on a fast, then there is probably an intra-abdominal injury there. If there isn't fluid seen on the fast, it does not mean that there is an absence of abdominal uh, uh, injury. I think what it means is that either the, 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 the pace the, the scanner has missed, which is not a comment about their abilities, it's that fast is difficult, or that fluid hides, or that there is only a small amount of fluid. So what? why do I mention fast? Well, one, it's out there and exists. And two, actually, I think in a, mass casualty situation where you are or where you're trying to stratify a number of patients for either surgery or imaging to then decide what happens to them fast is a good adjunct to your initial clinical examination to help you increase your level of confidence about who you're going to send to theatre what order you might send people to ct scan prior to going to theatre so it does have utility i just think we have to be really careful with it um because really we have this and we have ct um which for um, the nice sort of self-obsessed radiologist, as far as I'm concerned, is 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 the hospital. We know that's not true. Um, so um, what can I tell you about CT? Um, invented by Godfrey Hounsfield. Um, he, he was a very interesting person, a, a volunteer reservist in the uh, RAF during World War II. He joined the wrong service, clearly should have joined the army. Um, he was an instructor in radio mechanics. He joined EMI um, in uh, 1951. Um, and despite EMI being a musical focused uh, uh, business, um, he they developed the CT scanner, um, and the idea is effectively it's a rotating, slicing um, X-ray that produces slices of images of a patient, um, and that picture in, the, in in sort of in the middle next to the EMI here, this is one of the first images that ever came out of it. This is um, a CT scanner of the head from the Atkinson Morley Hospital in London, which is where the first CT scanner was put in. The first patient was scanned in October 71. Uh, that was a brain scan. The scan itself took five minutes for the images to be acquired, and it took two and a half hours for the images to be processed into something that we can see and, and report on. Um, next to that is a reconstruction from a CT traumogram, um, and now we can scan the whole body um, pretty much in, in eight seconds or less, quite frankly. So uh, the, the, the degree of sort of progress that's been made in CT um, is phenomenal. Um, Hounsfield was awarded uh, a Nobel Prize in 79 for his development of the CT scanner. Very sadly, EMI didn't realise what they had particularly, weren't desperately interested in medical imaging, so they gave it away um, for basically nothing. Um, they gave the technology away, which I suspect the company probably regrets evermore. So the CT scan, how do we scan in trauma? This is the sort of the bit that everyone gets excited about. Um, there are several options about uh, image acquisition in trauma. Um, and fundamentally, there's a regional approach, I am just going to scan a certain area. There's the traumagram approach, I am going to scan the whole body. I would advocate that you know, if there's been a significant mechanism of injury, you really ought to scan the whole body because, you know, trauma doesn't just specially miss out certain regions. If somebody's got enough injury to be brought in as a trauma, they've earned, they've crossed the threshold to, to get a full body CT scan. Um, so the next question is, how do you uh, give that patient contrast to image them? So there are three different recognized sort of contrast administration ways that the Royal College of Radiology advocate, and they can be found on the Royal College site. So I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but to say... Um, you can give contrast 
You always do the head non-contrast. You can then scan the whole body non-contrast should you wish. And then, then we would scan either in an arterial phase to look for arterial injury, in the venous phase to look for organ injury, or what is most, most commonly done these days is a combined, what's called the Bastion protocol largely, but it's a it's a dual uh, dose of contrast. So you give a bolus of contrast, you wait, you give a second bolus of contrast, and you do a single pass scan, and you get a single set of images which have a, an arterial phase superimposed on a, on a venous phase. Now, there are risks with that. There are compromises to that. And the largest compromise is actually that the spleen doesn't get imaged very well. But there are a load of tricks that radiologists can do, second ways of looking, and I'll show an example of that later on, about how you can look for spleen injury, even if there is some compromise. Um, I ought to talk about dose because I talked about people losing arms and whatnot. Look, the best, the lowest dose um, is this is this combined uh, traumagram protocol. And, and that's why I think really it's the most sensible one to do. It's easy to acquire. It's a single pass, fast scan, um, and it's a low, relatively low dose examination for the patient. And if you do have issues with the organs being enhanced slightly wrong, and this is not overly common, but it does happen, you can always go back and scan again. Um, and you're still going to be giving the patient a reasonably low dose scan. What I do say is that trauma centers really ought to have a set trauma protocol. There was a nice paper out in Clinical Radiology in May 16 that looked at 13 major uh, trauma units in Wales, of whom eight had no formal trauma protocol for imaging. And I think that's bad. I don't care what trauma protocol you have. I think you have to have, and I said I wouldn't be dogmatic. I'm going to try and be a little bit dogmatic. I think you should have a trauma pro imaging protocol because fundamentally, the things that really make things work well in trauma are a smooth process and people who know what they're doing and a system that is in sync and works well. And I think that's why that's why trauma centers that work well, work well. And that's why Camp Bastion in, 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 in Afghanistan worked well, not because it was military, not because we're particularly special in the military, but because everyone was honed and practiced and did pretty much just that. Um, and there was very much a hands-on full team approach that was completely practiced at doing it. So let's quickly talk about access for contrast. Fundamentally, that's intravenous. There is intraosseous access given, or there is intraosseous access available, certainly for resuscitation and certainly forward outside of hospital. None of the devices um, that um, gain intraosseous access, although they have been shown to work on certain studies, none are licensed for use with intravenous contrast. Um, and therefore, my advice is to gain good intravenous access, even if that's a trauma line, in the ED department before you bring a patient around to have uh, their contrast administered through CT and also know what those intraosseous devices look like because you could be forgiven on the x-ray for thinking this is a bit of um, metal foreign body that's come into the patient but actually it's the metal spike from their fast the easy IO device and here's here's another one in, in the shoulder. Um, the other thing of course is you have the big risk or the big risk with uh, intraosseous access and contrast is that you fail to inject an awful lot of contrast into the right place and you can get uh, uh, um, skin necrosis, you can get pain, you can get compartment syndrome, um, you can get local infection. Um, it has been reported they're not overly common and I suspect part of the reason they're not overly common is because we don't usually do intraosseous contrast injection and certainly not in the UK. So good resuscitation and, and fast CT. This is a picture you should never ever see, uh, certainly never again. This is an old CT scanner. This is a patient basically dying in the CT scanner. This is somebody trying to do some sort of resuscitation. You can see all the blood pots. They're trying to do, they're trying to do emergency resuscitation um, and crash resuscitation in a CT scanning room. And you can see the room's not set up for that. You can see there's, there's no access to the patient. It is a complete disaster of a situation. With good access, with good IV access, with good training and with good team working, that should never happen. And this should happen. You should have CT rooms that are set up for trauma imaging where there's plenty of space. You should have Belmont type, or I'm not gonna, uh, you know, again, advocating a particular manufacturer, but you should have these bucket type resuscitation devices, which can just give an awful lot to a patient in a short period of time. And you should train. That's why Bastion worked. And that's why that's why that military resuscitation pathway worked in, in, in terms of trauma patient management. It's because we worked and trained together. And it's that training that's key. And, that, and that's the thing that's easy for me to say, sitting and talking at a computer screen, but it's the difficult thing um, to deliver in reality. And don't forget that a CT can be interoperative. This is a patient whose aorta was clamped um, to gain stability before we went on to image them. Um, I was going to talk rapidly about brain hemorrhage, but I am, I think, running out of time. I've got only about 20 minutes left. And I'd like to perhaps give some opportunity um, for, for some questions. Um, so I just wanted to say, look, you, this is an extradural or an epidural hematoma. You can see it curving in. These things tend to be higher pressure. Um, they tend to be associated with fractures. They usually 
uh, in the temporal parietal region with a fracture, and that's the sort of the classical location. They don't tend to cross sutures in the skull. They can do in children, but they don't usually. This is a more, you can see that the, 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 the shape, so we, we're bulging in, and this way we're, we're bulging out. So the curve is different. This is more like a lens. And this is a subdural hematoma. Um, they tend to be more chronic in terms of their, their, their clinical onset. They can cross sutures. They're often venous. Um, and because they tend to be a bit slow in presentation, you don't get this, this very dense is blood. This is what blood looks like when it's hyperacute. And as blood then settles out, you get a reduction in the density of blood and actually it starts to look a little bit more like fluid and small ones, small subdurals can therefore easily be missed. This is a subarachnoid hematoma and it's sitting around the circle of Willis at the base of the skull. And you can also see that blood invaginating into the salsa. And that's sort of the classic appearance of a subarachnoid. They can also go into the ventricles um, and then this is very bad news. This is intra, um, this is sort of intraaxial. This is parenchymal bruising, and this is an awful lot of it. This has a bad prognosis. These are cerebral contusion, brain bruises. Um, MRI is far more sensitive for small ones of these than CT scans. And we'll talk about MRI briefly. Um, and I think I probably ought to point out the significant progression of those contusions is worse, is, is associated with a very poor outcome for the patient, unfortunately. So MRI, um, so look, magnetic resonance imaging, probably really best known as magic resonance imaging. This is a dark art, and that's why we've got Professor Snape there. P MR scanning is all about chucking someone in a socking great magnet, aligning all of their hydrogen uh, atoms in the body in a particular plane with the magnet and trying to knock them out of that plane with, with radio frequency and measuring how fast they go back into plane. Um, um, that's pretty much all I'm gonna say about it. I do want to say a couple of things. I don't think it's that got that much of a role in, in acute trauma because of this. And because of that's why Wiley Coyote is there being slammed by the magnet. This is an enormous magnet. It's many thousands of times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And um, therefore it does things to metal. Um, and you can never be sure in trauma if a patient has metal in them or not. There are some papers published about gunshot injuries and how a patient's then gone into an MRI scanner. I would observe that in all of those papers, one, the paper ends with a caveat that says, don't hold us, hold us responsible for, if you do this. Two, um, they're almost always, in fact, there are all handgun injuries where there are lead rounds rather than any type of ferromagnetic material. But of course, rounds aren't always ferromagnetic, uh, aren't always lead and often are, or can be coated and they can be high density or they can be made, you know, shotguns and all that sort of thing. Um, you can have metal, uh, non, you can have ferromagnetic pellets. So I would absolutely say, do not use MRI in acute uh, uh, trauma. Do consider it after a trauma CT as a second line investigation, as long as you're happy that there's no metal in the patient. Um, so let's look at some patients. This is a patient who fell uh, at 30 foot. Um, they've got a facial smash injury. Um, we do classify in terms of the four, one, two, and three. We talk about um, um, tripod fractures and whatnot, but you do get patients like this where literally there is no other descriptor for this other than a facial smash injury. You could spend a year describing the various little fractures associated with it. And it wouldn't really get you anywhere further than saying facial smash. Um, this patient's also had um, a, a, a pneumothorax that you can see, and they've had skull vault fractures. Um, you can see the collapsed lung underlying that pneumothorax. This is the air, which isn't dense. So that's why it's very black. Dense things are, are white on a CT scan. And I've tried to reconstruct the CT. This is a picture that loads of orthopods love that radiologists don't really use very much. But you can see the femoral fracture. It's very hard to see it, but there's there's um, fractures through the superior and inferior pubic ramus. There's fractures through the sacrum. And this is actually a vertical shear pelvic injury. Uh, and the thing I would comment about these is that they are usually associated with a visceral injury such as a bladder or urethral rupture. This is an electric scooter versus a car. Why am I showing you this? One, electric scooters are becoming more popular. Two, they're exceptionally dangerous. Three, um, are, uh, I've put the um, pictures of the uh, organ injury scales uh, in grading scales. Like that. I never used to use them and I've recently changed my view on that. I used to think, well, look, the patient is under managed uh, uh, because they are bleeding and they're unstable and then they're going to go to theatre or to an interventional radiology to stop the bleeding or they're going to be managed conservatively but actually the grade does matter and it matters in many reasons but one of the big ones um, in this new paper that's recently been produced is actually it helps the hospitals get their income in because actually coders code for injury by organ injury grades. And if we don't grade them on radiologically, then the, the, the hospitals don't get their income and hospitals will then struggle. And um, the other thing that I would also like to point out at this point is that these grading schemes were developed and are, are for the use for blunt trauma, not for penetrating trauma, but we have no other version for penetrating trauma. So we use them in penetrating trauma anyway. So this is an electric scooter versus a car. This is the same accident, a second individual on the same electric scooter. Um, and this is their injury set. You can see the, he, uh, I hope you can now see the pneumothorax on the right with basically a right 
lung collapse. You can see the air below uh, within the, the subcutaneous soft tissues of the anterolateral chest wall um, that comes with the trauma associated with that. Um, now I've shown the brain here, there's a big contusion over the occipital region and that goes with a, a, a parenchymal hematomas. And I told you earlier on that those brain bruises are bad. Very sadly, this patient did not survive this, this, this accident and, and died a week after admission. Um, and you can also see here, this. you can see on the, on the, on the right hand side, this is the, the sinus um, uh, filling with fluid. This is the transverse sinus. And you can see contrast. That's that fluid within it that picks it out. And on this side, it's a slit. And that's because, um, that's because we've got uh, a thrombus causing that sinus to be occluded. And again, that goes with badness. Uh, and as I said, this patient sadly did not survive the injury. Um, another trauma patient, this is a road traffic collision, um, and this is a big liver laceration involving both lobes of the liver, uh, at least 12 centimeters in size. This is a, what, at least a grade six injury. And below this dot of high density here, this is a frank acute blood um, hemorrhaging out into the gallbladder fossa. Um, so this is what acute bleeding looks like, and this patient had to have that um, um, stopped clearly to survive. There are injuries to the spleen that you can see here. These are multiple splenic contusions. This is a grade three splenic injury. This arrow is pointing to the internal carotid artery. If you look on the contralateral side, the artery is round and white within. This one is not round and there is a black line across the sort of postralateral margin of it. That's a dissection of the internal carotid artery. Um, and above that, um, the artery stopped filling completely. And uh, thankfully the patient had an intact circle of Willis, but um, lost the right uh, internal carotid artery supply as a result of uh, dissection. And that's a very easily missed injury. And that's one that it does often get missed. And therefore I pointed out specifically for that reason. This is a road traffic collision where the um, radiology, the CT has combined with Severus Snape, Professor Snape coming in with his MRI. And you can see the burst compression fracture of the C6 vertebral body. You can see the retropulsion into the canal. This high signal within the cord, this white sort of stripiness, this is cord um, uh, edema in the cervical cord. Um, and there's a paraspinal hematoma as well. And this is the burst fracture as seen in the axial plane, i.e. cross-sectionally from the feet looking up. This is a stab wound in the buttock. This is the bleeding site here within the buttock. This is the tract of the wound. Now, stab wounds are often difficult to see. The giveaway for a radiologist is the gauze that's covering the wound on the, on the skin surface, um, but um, they can often be very difficult for us to see. Um, the key here is the bleeding um, and also the injury pattern. We're getting an awful lot of buttock stabbings up in Birmingham. The gangs are trying to give each other colostomies to show that they've been punished by the other gang. Um, so that's just a sort of a local trait that we're seeing. This is a work accident, an individual crushed by a tractor, and we've got pelvic fractures, and you can see the fractures here. This is bowel, and as the bowel comes down, the rectum, the sigmoid comes down into the rectum, you lose the bowel sort of form. And, and, and you could actually sort of think, oh, well, there's hematoma here, it's a bit odd to look at, I'm not sure what's going on here. This is complete rectal transection. This is really hard to diagnose, um, and um, CT can struggle with images, and this is one particular injury that does really cause us difficulty. So rectal transection, thankfully not overly common. Um, so let's quickly talk about um, mass casualty and multi-trauma situations. Um, thankfully, we don't have them that often. Unfortunately, they are becoming more and more common. And where do they really, why do they really matter for, for medicine is because it is unusual. It's unusual in terms of the mechanism, the pathology, and it overwhelms demand rapidly. And we have a limited capacity and resource in all aspects of, of care. And, and these mass casualty incidents completely and utterly overwhelm our care. Um, and so that demand can outstrip supply. What does that mean? It means we need to have special rules. Drop your thresholds for imaging just image everyone liberally and use imaging as a triage to manage patients throughout the hospital know your department's maximal capacities for managing patients scan or, or practice these practice the the, the interactions with, with departments practice how you move patients around the hospital um, um, and remember not try not to use your entire resource up in the first wave because after the first acute wave there's going to be ongoing revisits to theater Re, re, repeat in, uh, visits to imaging, repeat attendances in ITU and all these other bits and pieces. So very firmly be aware of, of what you can and are able to deliver and plan. Ballard's rules for radiology, scanning is absolutely critically dependent on portering and I'll show that in the next slide. Output is critically dependent on your IT. Everything is digital now and a single traumagram can have four and a half thousand images. Four and a half thousand images is a lot to look through, a lot to show on a screen and a lot for a computer to process. And the minute those things go down, you're stuffed. 
doesn't matter how many radiologists you throw at the thing. If your, your IT, your PAX system, your digital imaging system can't cope and you don't have enough workstations to reformat images on, you're stuffed. And the same is true. It doesn't matter how many scanners you have. If you can't get your porters working efficiently, you're stuffed. This is a really old paper. This is a 2006 paper with a four slice CT, which shows the CT examination. This is mass casualty. This is a single casualty. That CT examination taking two minutes. But look, imagery construction, four minutes. This is right down now. This is this is almost negligible now. Image CT examination takes eight seconds now, and the, and the imagery construction is a minute or two. But this bit doesn't ever really change. It's that patient transfer and preparation, getting the patient onto the CT gurney of, of, of the CT uh, bed of the CT scanner, but also the key even more to that is getting the patients into the CT room and getting your porters lined up in and out. Uh, a, a 2011 paper with a far better CT scanner got that patient's an hour rate up from 6.7, um, which is hilarious, 0. 0.7, up to 4.8. So I'd say 7 to 8 to 15 patients um, in an optimistic world. Um, so it's about portering. Please remember that images are just images. Treat the patient, not the image. Now, uh, as a last rush uh, prior to questions, um, where do we go in the future? Where are things going to go? Um, this is who perhaps I think I ought to be, Michael McIntyre. This is who my colleagues really think I am, um, uh, much to my gross disappointment. Um, forward ultrasound. So this is what we're playing with in the military. This is a butterfly uh, ultrasound machine that actually has a computer on board that can act as any sort of ultrasound frequency generator, and we can operate it remotely. So um, the scan, we've done several scans in Belize and, and further abroad uh, from the UK, um, and we can operate, we can train people to to have very limited abilities in ultrasound because they just effectively hold a probe and then the machine is driven, directed and guided by a radiologist or a sonographer in the UK. Um, so this is a great piece of equipment. It's being used by the MOD. It's been used on the International Space Station. Uh, resource limited areas such as Nicarag Nicaragua and Haiti have also used it as a massive thing on the horizon. This is in the near future. Other forward imaging, near infrared scanning for brain hemorrhages. It's, it's very limited in its abilities um, in terms of the depth of the hematoma it can identify, but it is being used in the States. This is brain scope, which is um, it's EEG acquisition in, a, in association with patient symptomatology to predict who may or may not be suffering from a brain injury. These are, I think, in the sort of midterm future and dubiousness as to whether they're going to be, you know, regularly used. Forward CT, how far forward do you want to put your CT scanner? You know, you could put a CT scanner right by the derailing of a train to scan patients before they get to a hospital to work out who does or doesn't need to go to an orthopedic hospital or a major trauma center. You could do that with mass casualty uh, 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 events. You know, the Germans are driving CT scanners out in ambulances to do CT uh, head acquisition on stroke patients so that they get their, 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 their stroke treatment initiated before they even arrive at the hospital. I put drones in. I'm not going to say any more than that drones are a thing for the future because Colonel Parker's going to talk on that in a few weeks. And I'm going to finish by saying just a few other bits and pieces. You know, we're not too far off that Star Trek tricorder. This is this is Mouth Lab, uh, sort of a, a current, exciting, possibly new piece of kit that is effectively being touted as a modern tricorder. It can measure blood sugar, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, ECG, respiratory rate, heart rate variability, temperature, lung spirometry. And this is Super Sapiens um, blood glucose monitor that sits its Abbott technology, sort of sending it out into the cycling or to the sporting world for continuous blood glucose monitoring. And we could end up with smaller image acquisition systems as well. That is me with five minutes to spare.